Hi, everyone. I'm Ivan Bayuki, and welcome back to Wall Street Silver. Our guest today is Michael Gayed. He is a portfolio manager at Terrasso Investments. Welcome back, Michael. Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. So, Michael, you know, the gold and silver markets are in the toilet right now. Everyone on Reddit, Wall Street Silver, and all the gold and silver bugs on Twitter, <laughs> they're all whining nonstop and crying about this. Is is it just, is it more, is it, right now the dollar is relatively strong, you know, DXY, the Dixie. Is that the main thing holding us back right now, this dollar rally, or is there something else going on here that we should be paying attention to? You know, this year I've been seeing many times on Twitter at Lead Lag Report is, unequivocally an anomaly from so many perspectives there's nothing really in history that you can point to that looks anything like what we've seen not in terms of looking at gold silver stocks bonds as standalones but in terms of the interaction of various asset classes and sectors to each other if i were to say to you guys a year ago the dollar is going to be the best inflation hedge <laughs> i would have been laughed out of the room yeah, yeah that's right. That's true. It's, fact. it's completely insane. If I were to tell you a year ago that you'd have this potential existential energy crisis with Europe, but you want exposure to large caps, which are multinational, that get revenue from the Eurozone, that they'd outperform domestic small caps, you'd laugh at me too. There's so many things which are just bizarre about this. And, you know, gold uh, and silver, and I'd say more gold, you know, they tend to be diverse fires, right? Gold in particular really is more of a non-correlated asset that tends to do fairly well in heightened stock market volatility. Usually only really have three risk-off plays, right? Long duration treasuries, gold, and the dollar. They benefit historically from stock market volatility. And oddly enough, treasuries have been the worst of that. The dollar has been the best of that. And the gold and gold's been in the middle. And again, it's just a very strange world we live in when you see these tail events wagging all at once in all these different places. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many people on FinTwit on Reddit appreciate the abnormality of the environment, which makes analysis wildly difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's almost no historical comparisons. You know, 2008 is not a perfect comparison. There's just too many different variables right now. The, you know, the 1970s, which was the real last high inflationary period we had, you know, this it's not comparable to what's you know just the, the the sheer levels of debt in the system are, you know, three to four times bigger relative to the size of the economy now compared to the seventies. So and, really that's, and that's very much hellish, right? That's hellish yeah. because it's like let's go to the seventies for example. So even let's go back to the three risk off plays, right? Treasuries, gold, and the dollar. Okay, a lot of people because my own funds use treasuries as the risk off asset. They're rules based, right? They follow certain leading indicators to volatility in equities. Mm -hmm. And they use long duration treasuries, all three of my funds, ATAX, Rojo, they use treasuries, Jojo, as the as the risk off play. So I have so many people on Twitter saying to me, oh, you're using treasuries in an inflationary bear market. Why in the world would you do that? Because even in the 70s, treasuries in a moment in time, when you had these high volatility spikes for risk assets, did comparatively a hell of a lot better, and in some cases even made money during the mm -hmm. last real high inflationary cycle. So to your point, You've never even had a, a, a cycle you can compare this one to, again, in terms of the behavior, which makes it, again, wildly difficult. And you would think that it'll be actually wildly bullish for gold and silver, right? Because it's like, well, shit, if this is the outcome of all of this insane leverage, all of these stupid asinine policies, that it's a questioning of central banks, it's a questioning of fiat. Right. But then, you know, gold is kind of eh, silver is kind of eh. I mean, re in reality, Bitcoin is blah. Right. I mean, all the things, all the narratives which you would think should pan out to be true, uh, they're not playing out. Some of the policies we're seeing out of Europe and our own Fed just don't seem to make a lot of sense to a lot of people. You know, the 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 European Central Bank, they just raised rates like a month ago, 50 basis points to zero. They raised rates <laughs> to zero percent to fight inflation. Uh, just the other day, they raised rates another 75 basis points um, to and, and with an incredibly hawkish tone, which really implies, you know, how is how Italy, Greece, Spain, Portugal, some of the peripheral European countries, I don't know how they survive a really hawkish European wow. central bank. And our own Fed just keeps raising rates. You know, they don't they're raising rates into a recession. 
Are they trying to break something intentionally? Do you think that's the strategy? It's just ignore the pain and just break it. So first of all, in in describing describing Europe, I'm a, I'm a CFA charter holder, so I'll I'll use a term from the CFA level four, which is that Europe is clearly f right, given the way that things have played out here. Okay, we're gonna beat okay, it. But, beep it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the other. Okay, right. No, but 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 hold on. But but I think this is this is you're hitting on something, which is which is why this is such a nasty catch twenty two. Okay, mm -hmm. so you've got to break inflation. It's not just on the commodity side; it's clearly also on the demand side especially on the housing side, which we'll talk about too, which is a big driver of this, this expansion in credit. So, okay, you've got to break inflation, but at the same time, in the case of the Eurozone, how are you going to break inflation without breaking the pigs? Portugal, right. Italy, I, all the things which were a major concern in 2011 where they had an opportunity to use austerity to break all this debt, they ended up kicking the can down the road because Draghi said whatever it takes, and that alone caused a complete abdication of responsibility. Okay, so now inflation's kicking back, Okay, the ECB needs to counter it, but if they counter it, you're going to have sovereign debt spreads widen, okay, which could cause conceivably a crisis. You know, it, it, you often lose faith in a currency when the currency is free falling, right? Which right. you're seeing with the euro, and you're seeing that also, also with the yen. You're not seeing with the dollar just yet, but that's because of the reserve currency status, which who knows how long it'll last. On the point about breaking something, this is really important because I think I'm back to the Twitter community, FinTwit community, and in the media, you often hear this line that. The Fed will pivot when something breaks, when the Fed breaks the stock market. It has nothing to do with the stock market. It has everything to do with credit spreads. Okay, mm. why? Okay, Because credit spreads meaning the differential between junk debt and AAA okay, and high quality. Mm. Why do credit spreads matter? Because when the bond market starts saying that these highly levered entities are at risk of default, of bankruptcy, to such an extent that you now have to demand more yield, Okay, that's where something breaks, and the Fed pivots when the bond market tells them in terms of the spread movement. Now, to your point, I've, I've, I am a believer in this idea that inflation is a process, deflation is an event. Right, inflation is a process, deflation is an event. Mm -hmm. So, in many ways, I, I can make the argument that the Fed, the ECB, every single central bank wants there to be an event, because how else are you going to break this high inflation? How are you, are you going to get to average annualized 2% uh, unless you have some deflation scare right. Right, that, that shocks the system? All this nonsense around 75 basis points and then the next meeting, they do 100 basis points. It's like, well, this is bullshit. It's not going to save the system. I, I've said this before. If you really want to save the system, you have to shock the system, rip the Band-Aid off. Ripping the Band-Aid off could cause the default. But the, the default, where, wherever it comes from, would be a way of taking out excess liquidity, breaking animal spirits. That probably, by the way, might be actually quite beneficial for gold, silver, right? Just in that right. kind of moment in time, that scare. Uh, but that is probably the best thing that can happen. And I, I would argue that they want it to happen. So is there some point where they do have to respond or do they just, after it happens, they or they use that as the excuse to then change policy? They need something to, you know, to actually break? Mm-hmm. Uh, every single central bank uh, banker is a master at hindsight bias, mm -hmm. right? Just full stop. So yes, I do think they look. They they don't they don't anticipate they they react. I mean, if 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 Powell were really anticipating all the four hundred PhDs, or whatever the number is at the Fed, if they're really anticipating, I think it's thousands, like, thousands. Yeah, whatever whatever the insane <laughs> number is, right? It's like you didn't need to see that inflation was coming from the data. All you need to do is look at Twitter. Mm -hmm. And see all the sentiment around rocket ships, and I, I get it. I get it. It's funny and all this stuff, but all the kind of what I've argued is uneducated speculation, right? Mm -hmm. That that was taken. Was all Powell needed to do to see that there was inflation middle of last year was look at homes around his damn neighborhood and see the prices were appreciating at an insane uh, level, mm -hmm. same, insane rate of change. So so yeah, to your point, they always react, which means they need the event first. Is it even possible to get back to, to a 2% inflationary environment when some of these factors, long-term structural issues are no longer even available anymore? Okay, so so this is really um, critical, I think, which is that you talk about mean reversion mm -hmm. in the case of inflation, right? How do you get back to 2%, which is mean reversion, right? And I always make this point that mean reversion is perhaps the only thing you can quote-unquote guarantee when it comes to markets whatever asset class you're looking at. Where the mean is, which is obviously always changing, is a different issue. But there's always a degree of mean reversion. And mean reversion 
is a concept that's as old as the Bible. Right? He who is first shall be last and last first is mean aversion. Hmm. Right? So this is, this is something that's throughout time. Okay. Now, if you're going to go to 2%, which is mean aversion, you have to go past the mean. Mm-hmm. It's not like you bring down inflation to 2% and now your average is 2% from history. No, of course not. You have to actually overshoot it on the downside. Mm-hmm. So you need to have a period of deflation to get back to some kind of long run average. But just this is just math, right? Okay. Now, to your point, I, I wrote this piece on, on Seeking Alpha back in June of 2020. It's still there, right? As I said, the only way it out, because I was seeing all the, you know, just like you guys were seeing all the insane policy reactions coming out of COVID. I said the only way out is hyperinflation or defaulting to the Fed. Because mm-hmm. when your starting point is $30 trillion of government debt, never mind the unfunded $170 trillion of liabilities. Right. The only way you resolve an extreme is with another extreme. Now, it's not palatable politically to have deflation because deflation with high leverage means default. Mm -hmm. Right. So to your point, this is very hard to get out of, extremely hard to get out of. And I think that's why we have all these anomalies taking place in the marketplace. It's why I've been going through hell myself in my own strategies because treasuries are not acting as the safe haven because maybe treasuries, at least for a moment in time, are saying, well, damn, how the hell do we get out of this? Mm-hmm. Um, a, a lot of people are asking that same question. Um, you know, with thirty, almost thirty-one trillion in official government debt, uh, and debt to GDP in so many countries, even worse than the United States. But you know, what what is the definition? You know, how does a sovereign country who can print its own currency default? Yeah, they can keep printing, and nominally we'll keep paying our debts. So, what does that look like? Uh, a sovereign default. So, I mean, what, first of all, you can make an argument that the, the U.S. has already defaulted because <laughs> inflation is so high that you're getting less than your principal, right? There's a lot of ways to define negative, default. Negative real rates. Negative real right, rates. Right, exactly. Right. It's like, you know, it's like I always laugh when people say, oh, the U.S. is the wealthiest country on earth, but some of them forget all the liabilities, right? And even if people say, well, look at the net worth of assets minus liabilities, nobody who's going to buy our liabilities but us? It's, 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 it's a circular argument, right? Anyway, but the um, – but so, so let's talk about this in the context of the dollar. Right. So I because I keep making this point that the way the dollar is behaving, if you don't have the dollar weaken, that it seems to be almost anticipating some kind of a debt crisis is coming. You mm-hmm. combine that with Treasury yields spiking, which, again, has been my hell where the where treasuries, <laughs> the so-called risk off risk free asset have been riskier than equities, which yeah. you, it's like I made this point before. I had, I had people saying to me I, uh, on Twitter. Uh, and again, I'm running things by prospectus, rules based on my funds. They all got some nasty drawdowns because of this weird environment, which I keep showing is clearly an anomaly. I have people saying to me, well, you know, I lived long enough to see treasuries be the riskiest part of the marketplace. And it's like, are you kidding me? The entire system is based on treasuries. Mm-hmm. Mortgage rates are based on treasuries. Manufacturing is based on treasuries. It's the baseline for yeah. all cost of capital. So yeah. if the baseline for your cost of capital isn't, is, is collapsing and is, is really uh, broken, doesn't that mean the entire system is broken? Right. Don't we have bigger things to worry about than the value of our portfolios? Yeah. Everything's based off the 10-year, right? The 10-year bond is... Yeah. Uh... <laughs> the system doesn't run based on the short, the short end. It runs based on the long end, which the Fed does not have as much control of as people think. Yeah. No, what you know, you just mentioned uh, the, the everything's geared off of long-term, you know, treasuries, the 10-year uh, long-term rates. Uh, which the Fed doesn't have a lot of control over. And that's affecting the housing market right now. Uh, we're seeing refis are just down 80%. No one's re- refinancing their house now that rates are over 6%. Um, new housing purchases are down something like 25, 30%. Uh, we're seeing a lot more inventory coming on the market. And I know one of the things you often talk about is your gold to, your, your gold to lumber ratio as sort of a, a, a trigger on the economy. You know what is this the big picture of the next the next shoot a drop is the housing market the mortgage market and how that affects the bond market look the, the first of all the whole just to take a step back the concept around lumber to gold is not based on some random thing that i suddenly came up with i mean the whole research study that won an award people gonna roll their eyes because i often say that the award doesn't mean anything right but the <laughs> Recognition, I think, does say something from peers. But the point is that, you know, usually when lumber is weak relative to gold, that tends to precede major uh, crashes, corrections, bear markets in risk assets. And it's a very simple reason. It's because lumber is a play on housing. 
it, lumber is the clearest real-time way of seeing what housing starts going to do. That's a very strong correlation historically. Mm -hmm. So if lumber is weak, it means housing construction is going to be weak. If housing construction is going to be weak, it probably means housing demand is weak, which means consumer wealth declines, there's credit right. contraction, so on and so forth. Okay, now when you compare it against gold, which tends to act as a safe haven for a moment in time, again, going back to the three risk-off plays, treasuries, gold, and, and the dollar, you compare it against gold, it actually tells you quite a bit about risk conditions, right, in, in broadly. Now, housing historically weakens in advance of recessions. I mean, this is just pure fact, not my opinion. It also mm -hmm. tends to expand coming out of recession. So it is the leading indicator, which means that housing tends to move before stocks. Now, talk about things that are weird in the way this year has played out. Again, the anomaly. Stocks cratered one of the biggest crashes in the bond market in history, if not the biggest when it comes to treasuries in this yield spike. And only now is housing starting to break. And mm -hmm. lumber has been wildly weak you know, for, for many, many months here. So if, if that's the case, the housing bear market is still, I think, very early. Mm -hmm. right? And you're not seeing it across the entire U.S. And there's very different dynamics. I get it from the lead up to the 2006 top in housing. But housing, you have to break housing to break CPI. I mean, owner's equivalent rent is a big portion of, of the consumer price index. So you have to break housing. You have to bring affordability back in, not just in the U.S., but globally. Right? It's, it's, this is a global phenomenon, which makes sense because COVID was a global phenomenon. Everybody right. said, the hell with it. I'll stay at home and, and buy a bigger home for my office. So you've got to break housing. Now, if, if I don't believe the bear market in stocks ends unless the bear market on housing ends. And I think the housing bear market is still early. Now, again, what does that mean from a portfolio perspective? So gold in particular tends to act as a diversifier, meaning that it's not really correlated to stocks, right? Which is funny, right? Because I always make this point. You're not diversified unless you have a portion of your portfolio that you hate. Mm. <laughs> no, no, and, but think about that for a moment, right? So what am I... What, we're... we're, we're... <laughs> we're, we're, I have mining stuck, so I'm there with you. <laughs> you're diversified <laughs> as hell, my friend. No, no, but, 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 but think about that. It's like you're going to naturally hate the part of your portfolio that's not working. Yeah. It's not performing. So you have to have – so if it's not performing, it's not correlated. Yeah. Right? right? So I mean, that by definition, right? So okay. So so when you – and the the reality is everything is is a derivation of beta. Everything is a, a variation of equity risk, right? Again, except gold, and you can argue – you know, in quotes, poor man's gold, silver, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're towards the end of a, uh, a bull market in equities, then asset allocators don't have too many options to diversify, right? And again, risk off the diversifiers, treasuries, gold, the dollar. The dollar's already had to be moved. Treasuries, I understand. I think they're very attractive at these levels as a risk off play, not as a long-term hold. Mm -hmm. right? uh, but if you're thinking about it from a long-term hold perspective, yeah, gold probably fits the bill. Silver probably fits the bill as diversifiers. And if at the margin you have some of these big institutions saying we have to diversify away from equity beta risk, that marginal increase in demand and fund flow into precious metals, yeah, that could be a driver of what starts momentum. And you know, this is the other thing too. The 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 problem that the gold and silver space, as you guys know, is that you've not had secular momentum. You haven't had any real sort of persistent trend higher in price. And and the issue with momentum is that you need to have momentum taking place for momentum to persist, right? Mm -hmm. It's like by definition, momentum has to already have momentum for there for there to be momentum <laughs> as a start, right? Mm -hmm. So so that could be the 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 kickoff, right? If there becomes this kind of widespread belief that we are entering a much more prolonged bear market, which again housing would suggest we probably are are in, right? For equities, that could be the spark, the catalyst that starts the initial momentum that then feeds on itself. You know, is is do you see gold? We'll we'll, we'll ignore silver because silver's you know half half feet half gold and half uh, industrial or, uh, industrial metal. Is is gold sort of the fear trade? We got to wait for that ultimate fear moment uh, where people are sort of worried about everything before you think that takes off. It's interesting. I remember um, in 2011, 2012, I'm going to have him one of my Twitter spaces, Mark Faber. Right of the oh nice boom boom report we just had back, him, just had him about a week ago yeah yeah and and he 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 coined this idea which is that uh, if you want to short the Fed you go long gold mm -hmm. um, which kind of makes sense and that's partially even the Bitcoin argument you can say to some extent although there's a lot more um, frothiness and leverage right you can argue there um, in the digital currency space the analog space versus uh, rather the digital versus analog space so so from that perspective yeah you maybe you do, do need to have some kind of you know event to really kick off uh, momentum in gold and 
and at least for a moment in time, the belief that we have to go back to a more disciplined financial system. I'm a little uh, skeptical of that because I think people in power will do whatever it takes to stay in power, which means they'll never right. try to address the problems now. They're going to find a way to creatively prevent creative destruction. That's a. It's probably true. They're going to find some way. If they can, they're going to do another Mario Draghi, uh, <laughs> whatever it takes, and kick the can down the road at least 10 years until none of these current people are in office. Right. Uh, they've all retired from the Fed, and they're now working for whatever <laughs> hedge funds or... Uh, that will hire them or, or go on the speaking circuit like yeah, Jim yeah. does for two hundred thousand dollars a speech after they're done as Fed chairman or uh, you know we I think think we all know how this has played out historically. The question is, is there any more room to kick the can down the road, right. or is is this a come to Jesus type of you know? Well, we're we're the rope is we're out of rope at this point, and and I don't and, know and we it. could be and we listen we we unequivocally could be because inflation is telling you you're pretty much out of rope if 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 the only way you you uh you save the system is with liquefying but now the threat to the system is the liquefiers the central banks right? yeah. it's like i used that i put that tweet out before the fed was created in 1913 to prevent bank runs to cut off economic tail risk right now mm -hmm. they are the source of economic tail risk. Oh, yeah i've seen that so michael thank you very much for joining us we appreciate it and uh you know it's been almost a year since you were on our channel uh last in summer of 2021 but we I have not, aged a lot. We will, not, we, will not, we will not wait so long again. We'll have yeah. you around in the next two or three months and uh, get your update. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys.